love the line in that chorus that Jesus Christ is seated on high, the undefeated one. The undefeated one. Did you hear that? Maybe that's not good enough for you. Let me remind you what his role is now. That when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, and he spent a little bit of time here on earth, and then finally ascended into heaven, the Bible tells us that he is seated at the right hand of God doing what? Interceding. Tell the person next to you, he's seated up there interceding for you. And so if he is the undefeated one, and he's interceding for you, that should give you a little bit more hope this morning. Amen? Because he's undefeated. He's undefeated. And he's speaking to God on your behalf. Everyone needs to hear that this morning. Not just here. You need to hear it in here this morning. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, you look good this morning. You do. Now you look even better, those of you that smiled. Come on. Now that first song, I leaned over to Pastor Waters and I said, they don't seem very convincing this morning <laughs> with that first song. But now you look a little bit better. Come on, everybody just smile one time for me. All right. You look good when you smile. Praise God. I believe God wants to minister to us today. I, I'm excited, but yet I'm a little sad this morning because we are... Uh, we've, been, we've been going through the book of Ruth, if you haven't been with us the last several weeks, uh, but sadly today we come to the conclusion of this little but powerful book, and uh, it's an incredible, incredible love story uh, between God and his people. You know, we read it on the surface, it looks like an incredible love story uh, between Ruth and this great man of God, Boaz, but really, in all reality, it is a beautiful picture of God's love story to us that God loves us, and that he will do anything short of sinning to get us to understand that, we love, that he loves us, that he's working on our behalf. So it's, it's a, I'm excited to, to bring this to a conclusion, but a little bit sad. And next month, uh, I'm excited that God's been stirring my heart. Uh, next, uh, next month, I believe it is the third Sunday of the month, um, or is it the second Sunday? Pentecost Sunday is the second Sunday of the month, but we've got some great things. God's been stirring my heart uh, on, on uh, preaching a few messages on the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and we celebrate Pentecost Sunday, and we celebrate uh, the, that Jesus Christ promised the Holy Spirit to us and sent the Holy Spirit to the church uh, we, have some se we have several messages planned for that. I'm excited to have Austin Jones with us towards the end of the month for our spring revival. Those of you uh, may not remember him, but he, Austin, came, uh, I think, in uh, February of 2012, and he was itinerating to uh, go to Africa as a missionary slash evangelist, and God has used him in a mighty, mighty way to bring revival to Alaska. To uh, he's, been, he's at his second church now, just seeing God the resurrecting power of God in a community and a church being resurrected and, and training up leaders for that church to continue on. God has used him um, in the supernatural gift of healing, and uh, he's seen many people saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, healed in the, in the same services. So we're excited to have him. He's going to be here. Uh, that is going to be in, I believe uh, the dates are in the calendar, uh, and, uh, and in the bulletin, I don't have them right now. I think May 22nd, that's what it is. Sunday, May 22nd, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and then just Monday and Tuesday night, he's got to get back on the road for Wednesday. And so we're excited about those services and just excited. Excited about what God is going to be doing. Again, I want to encourage you to be out tonight. We've been focusing on the miraculous, and there's no greater miracle than the miracle of salvation. And like Pastor Waters said, if we want to see our loved ones saved, it's going to take a miracle. But we believe in a God of miracles. Did I remind you this morning that He's undefeated? So when you are praying and believing God for the salvation of your loved ones, and Jesus Christ, the undefeated one, is praying the same way, we know that God can do it. And so come on out tonight. We're going to have a great time of worship. And, and I know it's a beautiful day, but just enjoy the afternoon and get back out here at 6 o'clock to enjoy the presence of God. Can everybody say amen to that? Amen. All right, those of you who said amen, be here. I, I didn't hear 100 amens, but um, <laughs> just get out tonight. 
Amen. So the series that we've been going through is entitled, The Best is Yet to Come. And if you approach Naomi as she was uh, heading back to, uh, to Bethlehem, to her hometown after the, after the famine, getting a little ahead of myself, and you told her that, Naomi, don't worry about it, the best is yet to come, she probably would have been, because she was a little bit bitter and a little bit angry, she probably would have got right in your face and said, don't tell me that. Don't tell me that because God has treated me harshly. You know, sometimes we, we get to that point where we might feel that God did this to us or God's treating us harshly. A lot of people wouldn't air that opinion, uh, but I will give one thing to Naomi. Uh, her perspective on God may have been wrong, but at least she was honest. Uh, her perspective on God being the one who did all of this to her, inflicted all of this on her, that may have been wrong, but at least the woman was honest. We have to be honest with God sometimes. I uh, read this this week, and I just want to start off with this funny little antidote this morning. Not all days are created equal. Not all days are equally as good or as bad as others. Can you say amen to that? Some, some days you have a really bad day, and you just can't wait to get home and, uh, and, and just get to bed and start over again the next day. I, I love also the last song that we sang. Uh, one of the lines in there was, let me, be, let me be praising when the evening comes. When the day is over, whether it was good or bad, let me, let me still be praising God. So let me share this with you. You know you're having a bad day, all right? Now, those of you who had a, who've had a bad day, you can probably write down your own little antidote. But you know you're having a bad day when you wake up and you're fi- you find out that your waterbed has sprung a leak. Then you realize you don't even have a waterbed. Let that sink in for a moment. And if that is bad enough... You know you're having a bad day when you get out of bed and you hear the birds outside singing and then you realize that they're vultures. Come on, you with me today? This is going to be rough this morning. (laughs) Then the day goes on, you, you, you know you're having a bad day when you get in the car and you head out to work and you find yourself sitting at the end of the road waiting for the stop sign to turn green. It might be a sign to turn around. Then after all that is said and done, you know you're having a bad day when you show up for work and you're greeted by Mike Wallace from CBS's 60 Minutes. And you know you're having a bad day, this is terrible, when you're not feeling too well and you go to the doctors and you find out you're allergic to chocolate. That's just terrible. That is just a terrible day when you find that out. And then finally, you know you're having a bad day when you call your wife and you tell her you'd like to eat out tonight. When you get home, there's a sandwich on the front porch for you. (laughs) That's just a bad day you need to do over. Sometimes things go wrong. Sometimes we have those bad days. But we need to understand this, that every problem that we encounter, God has a promise. Every problem that we encounter, God has a promise. Maybe some of you need to write that down this morning. Every problem we encounter, God has a promise for us. So we've been going through the book of Ruth, and if uh, if you know this story, this will be familiar to you. Maybe Maybe you're unaware of this. In, the, in Ruth chapter 1, we, we, we come, uh, we in, we're introduced to a few individuals. The first one is Elimelech. Elimelech and his family are living in, in Bethlehem, in the, in the town of, of God, and, and uh, there's famine in the land. If you do a little investigating, uh, many believe that the book of Ruth was written during the time of the Judges. And there's a lot who speculate that it was written during the time of Gideon. It tells us in Judges chapter 6 and verse se- uh, chapter 7, 6 and 7, uh, the account of Gideon. We know that um, at this period of time, God was, was their king. And uh, they had, uh, when, whenever things would go wrong in the nation of Israel, God would raise up a judge and he would bring correction and he would bring direction to them and they would repent and they would begin to follow God again. And then sometime later, they would just, they would begin to fail. God and sin again and then God would raise somebody else up and so during a period of time we see in Judges chapter 6 and, and chapter 7 that Gideon um, was, the, was the man of God who God uh, 
called to be the judge over Israel. It tells us that the Midianites were so oppressive over the, uh, over the Jewish people that uh, when the Jews would, would plant their fields, the Midianites would just come and they would, and they would camp out on those fields and they would destroy the crops. They would kill the animals. It, it got so bad that, that the, the Jewish people had to go and hide in the hills and the clefts of the rock and they'd, they'd have to camp out to just hide away from the Midianites. So many suppose that this is the period of time and a Elimelech, uh, whose name means God is king, decides, uh, he kind of takes matters into his own hand and says, we've got to get out of here. We've got to find someplace else. And he moves his family about 40 miles and uh, he moves his family to Moab and things just go terribly wrong. And really what, what really began everything in, in motion, what, it, what, what really started everything in motion was instead of asking God for his direction, Elimelech, whose name means God is king. Instead of asking God, God, what do you want me to do? How am I going to take care of my family? Things are bad. You know, we just, you know, things are going from bad to worse. How do I take care of my family? Instead of doing that, he takes matters in his own hands. He moves his family away. Um, to, to the land of Moab and, and where they were living Bethlehem was uh, the, the, the name for Bethlehem was the house of bread so he moved his family away from God's provision away from God's people taking matters into his own hands and things went from bad to worse we know in chapter 1 that Elimelech passed away and then sometime later both of his sons who had married Moabite women passed away and things just got bad we know that Naomi, uh, with her two daughter-in-laws, decides then to, she makes one right decision at the end of, of all of this. In fact, in Ruth chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, he tell, she tells her daughter-in-laws, let's prepare ourselves, we are going to return home. She made one right decision, and it set her on the right track. You see, sometimes we make bad decisions. That was, that was our message uh, three weeks ago, message number one was bad decisions and a good God. Even when we make bad decisions, God has a way of bringing us back on track. And all we have to do is decide to say, you know what, I'm coming back to God. I'm coming back to the place of God's provision, and I'm coming back to God's people, and I'm going to do things right. I have no idea what's going to happen, but I'm going to do it. So she sits out on this journey. One of her daughter-in-laws by the name of Ruth decides that she's going to go with her, even though Naomi says, no, you need to stay here. You can find a husband here among your own people. And Ruth said, I'll have nothing to do with that. I'm going to go with you. I'm going to stay with you. She's beginning to learn how to be an honorable woman. She has no idea. Uh, she just really married into this, into this God family, and she has no idea how to serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but she's learning. And she makes one right decision with her mother-in-law, and they come back to the place of God's provision. And that's in, in the chapter 2, we discover the invisible hand of a good God. Times when God is working and we don't even see him working. It tells us in the Message Bible in Ruth chapter 2 verse 1, it tells us it, it just so happened. Or it so happened that when they came back, Ruth decided she was going to do what the custom was and she was going to go out into the field and glean. And what that means in Deuteronomy, it tells us that when they, would, when they would go out and harvest the field, that they were instructed to leave some of the stuff that they dropped, some of that stuff behind for the widows and the orphans and, and, and the aliens and, and those that, that were not of their, their people, and to leave that for them so that they would have something to eat. It was just God's way of providing for those that were struggling. And so it tells us in Ruth chapter 2 uh, that Ruth decides she's going to do this. She's going to do this. She's going to go out on the field. And the Bible tells us again in the Message Bible, it just so happened that Ruth shows up in Boaz's field. You know, we pray for miracles and we believe in a God of miracles. But oftentimes, the way that God works mostly in our lives is his providential working. That God is orchestrating things and it just so happens that this happened and that happened and we ran into this person and this person gave us a word and that person shared a scripture. It just so happened. Let me tell you, that's not a coincidence. That is the providential working of God. God orchestrates those things. It just so happened. Just so happened that one day, Pastor Waters, 
you were walking along. I'm going to take some of your testimony on the beach. And you ran into these Christian teenagers. And it set your course, your, the course of your life on a different path. It just so happened that God did this or did that. God orchestrated it. It's not karma like some believe. It's not some, you know, some cosmic force in the universe other than God. It is God. It is the providential working of God that he orchestrates these things. And so God begins to work. God begins to work in, in their life, and they, they, they run into Boaz. We're introduced to this man, Boaz. He wasn't an ordinary man. Boaz was an honorable man. He was a godly man. He was the man uh, above other men. In fact, in the Hebrew, they, there's a word that they give to it. It's called Yabor Ha'il, which means he was a man's man. If you were to picture the ideal man, and, and, and young ladies who are not married yet, let me tell you, you want to look for a Yabor Ha'il. Not necessarily if that's his name, but you want to look for a man who is a man of God, who is an honorable man, who will treat you with respect, who will honor you, who will work hard, who will be valiant, who will, who will serve God with all of his might. How many of you wives today can say, thank God for my man like that? Anybody? My wife. All right, thank you, honey. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I wasn't fishing for a compliment or anything. <laughs> but that's the kind of person that Boaz was. And it just so happened that Ruth showed up in Boaz's field. No, it, it wasn't just a, a, a coincidence. It was the divine hand of God. When you make a, one right decision to say, I'm going back to God. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to go back and do all that God has called me to do. I'm, I'm tired of just waiting for something to happen. I, I'm going I'm to go. I'm going to make the first move and say, God, I'm here. That is when the providential hand of God takes over. And then in Ruth chapter 3, um, last week we discovered that God was working and God uh, you have to read over Ruth chapter 2 just all that God did for Ruth and, and Boaz showed such great favor upon her uh, he was impressed by her you know God was at work I brought this point out but so was Ruth sometimes we sit back and we want God to move but sometimes God's expecting us to work and to do what he's called us to do it's different than that saying that goes around that God helps those who help themselves. I, there may be some truth to that. God will honor you when you do your part, when you begin to work. You begin to do what God has called you to do. And so that's what Ruth did. And God began to work. And then it tells us that, that uh, this whole idea of the kindred redeemer is what we want to bring out this morning and, and uh, explain what that really means and how that applies to us. That, uh, that Naomi starts to see the hand of God moving and, and uh, Boaz is, is showing favor towards Ruth. And, and so Naomi says something in, in, uh, in chapter 3. She said, you know, uh, isn't it about time that, that I found a good home for you, Ruth? God's moving, but then Naomi begins to take matters in her own, in her own, her own hands. And, and she begins to push things along. Sometimes there's a fine line between actually working and then taking matters in your own hands and pushing things yourself. How many of you know that doesn't end well? God, thank, thank God for his providential working. There are times when he just has to close a door. When it's just not working out. This is not what God's planned. I uh, heard the missionary that spoke at youth convention you know, sometimes we just need to get up and do what God's called us to do. It's a, lot, it's a lot easier for God to stop us from doing something than to get us started in the first place. Don't sit around and say, I wonder what God's will is. Before you know it, it's going to be 25 years later and you're still sitting there going, I wonder what God's will is for my life, what I'm supposed to do. Just begin to do what God's word calls us to do. And that's to be his servant and to serve in any way that you can. And God will open up the right doors. And so we're uh, in chapter 3, we begin to understand this, this principle of the Leverite marriage. Basically, what God is saying is he doesn't want anybody to live out their life a loser. He doesn't want anybody to miss out on life. That, that he has a way of bringing redemption. And so a, uh, a Leverite marriage was this. It's uh, the type of marriage in which uh, the brother of a deceased man is obligated to marry his brother's widow. And the widow is obligated to marry her deceased husband's brother in order to carry on the family name. So it's, it's God's way of being able to carry on a man's family name if he would happen to pass away and then also to provide for that widow, that woman, because God does not want that, uh, you know, want anybody to live out their life that way without any kind of hope. 
And so we discovered a little bit more about Boaz that he was not only a Yabor Hail, a man above all men, but he was also an honorable man. He was a worthy man. He understood the principle of patience. Sometimes we need to be patient. We need to be patient with God and we need to be patient with others. He was a man of integrity. In Ruth chapter 3, the bad advice was this. Naomi uh, basically said to Ruth, now listen, this is what you need to do. Since, since Boaz is showing some favor, I want you to go take a bath clean yourself up put on some perfume put on your best dress and go and go down to the threshing floor find out where Boaz is going to lay down at night wait till they're done eating and drinking and then when he lays down you just wait until everybody else falls asleep and you go over and slip over and uncover his legs and lay down there and he'll tell you what to do that's bad terrible advice and sometimes good people will give us bad advice, and that's why we need to get into God's Word and know what His Word says about the topic. That's just bad advice. Some people speculated, well, it was some kind of ancient custom or this or that. There's no custom here. There's nothing. I mean, there are some writings that date back that might say, you know, it might, you know, it, it might relate to something like that. Basically, what Ruth was saying, what Naomi told her to say was, go down to the threshing floor and ask Boaz to marry you. That's simply it. That's what happened. And so Boaz, he was startled, but he was an honorable man. He wanted to honor her. And then we come to find out that there was another man that was closely, closer related to uh, Naomi than she was, than he was. And so he said to Ruth, he said, look, there's another one. He's, he's a little bit closer relative than I am, and uh, he's first in line. So if he'll marry you, then so be it. You'll... You know, and if he's not going to provide for you, trust me, I'll make sure that you and Naomi are provided for. But if he will not marry you, sure, I will marry you. I'll, I'll take care of you. And so that, all of that just kind of uh, begins, to, begins to develop here, and we get to Ruth chapter 4. What Boaz wants is he wants God's will more than anything. And if you have a, a smartphone or a tablet, you can check out the live event on the Version Bible app, and uh, that's where we're going to begin right now in Ruth chapter 4, and I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation this morning because I like some of the, some of the description there. Um, it, it just gives a clearer interpretation of what, um, of what it's really saying here. So out of the New Living Translation, it'll be on the screens. It's also in the live event. It tells us in Ruth chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, so Boaz went to the town gate, and he took the seat there. He took a seat there. And just then, the family redeemer he had mentioned came by. Let me just pause there for a moment. The town gate was a very important uh, place. And, and if you haven't been with us the last several weeks, what I'm going to do is go through this, try to go through this a little bit verse by verse, and then share. I have three, uh, three points that I want to share with you today. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap things up. And I just I believe that God wants to speak to us today on on the fact that the best is yet to come that God is not through with us God's not through with our church he's not done working in your life he's still working and so the town gate was a very important place it was a place of commerce people would come and trade and buy and sell and and it was a place of uh, of industry it was a place of conversation uh, many times people would meet by the town gate it was also a place of justice and and what they would do sometimes if there was some type of dispute they would go to the town gate they would get some of the elders and they would sit them on a bench and they would present their case and then the town elders would uh, would make their decision and and the, and the parties involved would have to listen to what the elders uh, would say. So it goes on to say then, just then, here it is again, the providential working of God. What are the chances? Bethlehem was not a real prominent city quite yet, but it still had a lot of people living there. And people that lived in the surrounding communities of Bethlehem, they would go to that town gate, but it still was not a heavily populated place. But nonetheless, what are the chances uh, of you running into one person that, you, you know, that you're wanting to do business with, conduct business with? Let's say you go to the Huddle House. And uh, what are the chances you're sitting at the huddle house and you're having a cup of coffee and you're waiting for so-and-so to come along? What are the chances? If you didn't call them, if you didn't send a message to them, what are the chances of somebody, the person you're looking for, showing up at the huddle house? Some might say, well, that's just chance. Oh, that's just, you know, that's just amazing that that would happen. This right here is the providential working of God. 
Uh, Boaz knew where he needed to go. He needed to go to the town gate. He needed to talk to the elders. He needed to settle this matter. He was willing to marry Ruth, but there was one ahead of him. And if he was willing to take on all the conditions, then, then so be it. That's the right thing to do. He wanted God's will more than he wanted his own will. And so the chances of this man showing up, I don't have to do any kind of a math equation or anything. We're, we're really slim to none for this guy to show up. On that very day, at that very time, it was the providential working of God. Just then, the family redeemer he had mentioned came by, so Boaz called out to him, come over here and sit down, friend. Now, in the original text here, um, it's, it's maybe not as friendly as it, as it portrays here in the New Living Translation. It's, it's really sort of like, hey, buddy, I've been waiting for you. Come over here. We've got something to discuss. It indicates that Boaz were, was a little bit upset. And here's the reason why. I believe this is the reason why. Because this man knew that he was the family redeemer. But did this man do anything, anything to benefit Naomi or Ruth? No. His name wasn't even mentioned. In fact, his name is still not mentioned in Scripture. In fact, Scripture makes a great commentary by not mentioning his name. Because the man did nothing. He didn't honor God. He knew that he was the family redeemer. He knew his responsibility was to check on Naomi, to at least go and say, hey, do you have food? Do you have shelter? Is everything okay? To check with Ruth to make sure, you know, that she was doing okay. But, but there's no commentary at all here in the book of Ruth that this man did anything. So Boaz says, hey, buddy, I've been waiting for you. And believe it or not, God brought you by here. So sit down over here. So the man, you know, of course Come over and sit down. Boaz, I mean, if Boaz is asking me to sit down, I better sit down. Then Boaz called 10 elders from the town and asked them to sit as witnesses. And Boaz said to the family redeemer, you know Naomi. He's reminding him again. You, you know what this is pertaining to. I don't, I don't have to enlighten you too much. I mean, the man probably had no idea what happened on the threshing floor the night before. But the man's just kind of dragging his feet. You know about Naomi, who came back from Moab. She's selling the land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. Let me explain this. What happened here was, when uh, Naomi left, they didn't just leave the land unattended to. Somebody else just kind of assumed the property, and they had to go through kind of a legal battle when, when she came back. You know, she knew what land was hers, and there was somebody farming the land, because that's just simply what they did. So they had to go through, they had to sit with the elders, they had to figure it all out, sort it all out. And so, you know, uh, it, it's just assumed by reading this that they've already gone through this, that this process had already begun. And so this land belonged to uh, Ruth. And so he's, he tells this guy, well, you know, this land that, you know, that uh, had, had been kind of vacant for the last 10 years, it really belongs to Ruth. And Ruth is going to have to sell it to, you know, to provide for her family. And so that's, that's what I'm here to talk to you about because... You're the closest one related to her. And uh, so Boaz said to the family redeemer, again, you know who Naomi is, you know the situation. And so verse 4, he says, So I thought I'd speak to you about it so that you can redeem it if you wish. If you want the land, then buy it here in the presence of these witnesses. And if you don't want it, let me know right away because I am the next in line to redeem it after you. And the man replied, All right. I'll redeem it. I mean, it was a good price. Really, what the man is saying is that no strings attached, I'll take it. You know, if that's, if that's my response, I'll buy it. It's an investment. I'll, you know, I'll take it. But then, verse 5, Boaz told him, of course, your purchase of the land from Naomi also requires that you marry Ruth, the Moabite widow. <laughs> now the plot thickens a little bit. That way she can have children who will carry on her husband's name and keep the land in the family. So basically what he's saying is that you are responsible for buying this land from Naomi to provide for her family. Then you are to marry Ruth, which probably wasn't a bad thing. Ruth was probably an attractive woman, a hardworking woman. But then when it's all said and done, if she should have children... You need to just then give the land to those children as their inheritance. Going back to 
when uh, the Israelites came out of slavery and got into the promised land, there was an allotment of land, and that was very important to God. God wanted them to have that land and still does today, and there's battles over that land. But let's, let's just remind you again that God's the undefeated one, that that land will be rightfully divided someday, and God is in control of that. So basically what he's saying is, you know, you got to take care of this. Basically, uh, you need to just dish out some money, take care of these, these, these family members, and there's no guarantee. Now, there was a slight chance because we, we understand from the beginning chapters that, uh, that Naomi, uh, Naomi's two, two daughter-in-law, her two sons married these Moabite women. And so Ruth was married, uh, you know, probably close to about maybe seven years. We're not quite sure. Seven to ten years uh, that she's married to this man. And did, did uh, Ruth have any children? No. So it, it, there's kind of an indication here that maybe Ruth was barren. So there was a slight chance that this guy, this might still be a good deal for him. But there was also that chance that Ruth may have a child and that that land was going to be divided between the chi- that, that child or, or multiple children. And so that kind of thinkings. And then, and then so the man began to process this and, and we, already, we already kind of get this indication that this man wasn't the most honorable man to begin with. That way, he goes on in the latter part of verse 5 again, that she have children who will carry on her husband's name and and keep the land. Then then verse 6, then the man said, I can't redeem it. I can't redeem it because this might endanger my own estate. Now, in some versions, you'll read verse 6, goes on to say, you redeem it. You redeem the land. I cannot do it. Some versions, you'll see I or me referred to six times. What does that tell you about this man? He was all about himself. I, me, my, I just can't do it. Scripture makes a great commentary by not mentioning this man's name, that he was all about himself. He said, I might endanger my own estate. He could care less, basically, about this family. Now, in those days, it was custom in Israel for anyone who transferred the right of the purchase to remove his sandal and hand it to the other party. This publicly validated the transaction. So the family redeemer drew off his sandal as he said to Boaz, you buy the land. As I investigated that verse a little bit, I thought it was pretty interesting, taking off of the sandal and that sort of thing. And yes, scripture does make commentary that this was kind of the custom, but it actually goes much deeper than that. When you begin to investigate it a little bit, it was really kind of a thing of shame. That if, if a person wasn't, uh, wasn't willing to take care of the responsibility that God gave to them, that they publicly were brought before the elders. And this wasn't just Jewish custom. This was, this was customs uh, in, in, other, uh, in other areas. It may have been a custom even in Moab. Even though they were not God-fearing people, they still had some rules, some guidelines. And so... Um, what basically happened was this man was legally obligated. It was something that he should do, but he didn't. And uh, years ago, this custom basically uh, came down that, that they would take, they would literally take the sandal off of his foot. And it was a sign of shame that, that the person didn't do what they were obligated to do. And the family became known as the unsandaled. The unsandaled. It was a, it was a thing of shame. And so it goes on to tell us, um, let's, we'll read through the rest of this chapter together in verse 8 it says so the other family redeemer drew off his sandals Boaz said you buy the land and then Boaz said to the elders and to the crowd standing around him you are witnesses that today I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech Kilion and Malon and with the land I have acquired Ruth the Moabite widow of Malon to be my wife This way she can have a son to carry on the family name of her dead husband and to inherit the family property here in his hometown. You are all witnesses today. And then the elders and all the people standing at the gate replied, We are witnesses. May the Lord make this woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, from whom all the nations of Israel descended. May you prosper in uh, Ephrathath and be famous in Bethlehem and may the Lord give you descendants by this young woman who will be like those of our ancestor Perez and the son of Tamar and Judah the descendants of Boaz what they're doing here is that they are not only witnesses but they begin to bless 
Boaz and bless Ruth and bless Naomi. Let me tell you today, there is power in blessing. You could choose to be negative and you can choose to gripe about things and you could choose to talk about things. Or you could choose to be a voice of blessing. You could choose to bless somebody. You could choose to speak words of encouragement over people, words of blessing over people. And then it goes on to tell us, so Boaz then took Ruth into his home and she became his wife. And he slept with her and the Lord enabled her to become pregnant. This is the second indication that possibly Ruth was barren. But here, God begins to move. It is the providential working of God once again. And she gave birth to a son. What are the chances of that? That is the providential working of God because she needed a son in order to redeem the land and keep it in her family name. And lo and behold, not only did she become pregnant, and I know there's a 50-50 chance, but she has a son. God works it out. Then the woman of the town said to Naomi, praise the Lord. He has now provided a redeemer for your family. May this child be famous in Israel. May he restore your youth and care for you in your old age. May, uh, for he is the son of your daughter-in-law who loves you and has been better to you than seven sons. If you don't believe that, read back of what Ruth did for Naomi. And they named him Obed, and he became the father of Jesse, the grandfather of David, King David. And if you look in Matthew and Luke, in the beginning of both of those books, David is listed in the lineage of who? Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You see, God is a God who blesses abundantly, over the top, pour out his blessing on people's lives when they choose to do the right thing. But here, Scripture also gives us commentary on this man, the unnamed man, because here's the reality. Selfish people do not leave a good legacy. Selfish people do not leave a good legacy. In fact, Proverbs chapter 11 tells us this, verses 24 and 28. The world of the generous gets larger and larger, but the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. I love that translation because there is such truth there. Let us be generous people. Psalm 37, again, out of the Message Bible, wicked borrows and never returns, but righteous gives and gives. Generous gets it all in the end, but stingy is cut off at the pass. The reality of it is, is that selfish people don't leave a good legacy, but generous people leave an incredible legacy. Three things I want to share with you quick if you're taking notes. Number one, this whole chapter, the chapter four, deals with the idea of redemption. It, it, see, the book of Ruth began with a famine and it ends with a feast. It begins with death and it ends with a marriage and new life. God is that kind of God. He is a God of redemption. And today I want you to know whatever situation in your life you feel like has been lost or has been broken or has been severed, God is here to redeem it. And when God redeems, he redeems it abundantly, over the top. He pours out his blessing. And so we want to focus these three points on the idea of redemption. Number one, redemption restores life. Write it down. Redemption restores life. We see in those few verses, once again, Boaz gathers the elders and he brings them in. And not only did, did he restore the land, which was a sign of life for the Israelites, it was a sign of new life. When they came into the promised land, that land was a sign of a, a life of abundance, wasn't it? A life of God's blessing. And so, first of all, God restored the land. And then, secondly, he restored Ruth and, and, and Naomi's hope. And Ruth becomes his wife. And, and verse 13 tells us that she gave birth to a son. God had a way of restoring life to Naomi, to Ruth, and to their family. Boaz, doing what he did, being an honorable man, kept the family alive. Psalm chapter 23 tells us this about God's redeeming power. He restores my soul. 
He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. God is in the business of restoring. And today, maybe you've been discouraged. Maybe life has beaten you down. I believe that God wants to restore your soul today. He wants to restore. He wants to give you hope. He wants to give you direction. Psalm 51 tells us this out of the new uh, King James Version. It tells us this, that he restore, uh, the psalmist writes this, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Many believe that this was David writing this after, after his sin and, and after he's repented and he's still struggling through things and he makes this a prayer to God. God, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Maybe your Christian walk, has, you, you've struggled a little bit. Maybe you've, you've had some battles recently and you feel like you've lost your joy. God is in the business of restoring life. And he wants to restore the joy of your salvation today. Revelation chapter 5 tells us about the, the song of the redeemed. You know what? That, that's a picture, a beautiful picture of heaven. That there will be a great song of the redeemed. But God wants to return that song to us today. If you've received Christ... If he's changed your life, you are redeemed. God wants to put that song back in your spirit today. He wants to give us that song again. He wants to restore the joy to your heart. Because this is what happens. This is really the reality of it. John 10, Jesus tells us this. John 10, 10. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And maybe today you know that all too well. Because he's been working. He's devised a plan. He's put a target on your back and he's trying to destroy you. But Jesus said, I've come that they may have life. But he didn't end there. He was talking about eternal life. He was talking about new life. But from there he said that they will have life to the fullest. And he wants to bless you abundantly. Secondly, today, not only does redemption bring, restore life and bring new life, but Redemption brings blessing. When you make that decision that, that, that Naomi made in Ruth chapter 1, in verse 6, where she said, I am going to go back to the house of God. I'm going to go back to the people of God. I don't care what anybody else is doing, but I'm going back to God. I'm returning to Him. That redemption begins a chain reaction. And God begins to bring blessing to us. The women of the town in verse 14 begin to praise the Lord and begin to speak blessing over Naomi's life and blessing over Ruth's life. And, and it tells us in Proverbs 18 verse 21, the tongue has the power of what? Life and death. What that's saying is that the words that are going to come out of your mouth have power. They are powerful. And they have the power of life and or death. And we need to choose the right words to say. It tells us, it goes on to say, and those who love it will eat its fruit. I mean, it is, it, there's nothing better, there's nothing better than ministering to somebody and speaking blessing over their life. What you're doing is you're proclaiming God's goodness over their life. You're, you're in a sense, pro, pro, uh, prophesying really over their life, believing God that this is the God we serve and this is what he wants to do. He wants to take you from death to life. He wants to take you from despair to joy. He wants to change the situation that you're currently in. Proverbs 16, 24 tells us pleasant words are like honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. A spoken blessing does good to those who hear it. I want you to understand that. In fact, Strong's uh, exhaustive concordance of the Bible tells us this. The Greek word for this word blessing is eulogio. It's where we get our word eulogy from. Um, and really what it means is to speak well of to bless, to, to think or invoke a benediction upon somebody, to speak blessing and prosperity over their life. I, I remember seeing that bumper sticker, I love it, um, and, and I, I, I can never say it enough. Live your life in such a way that the preacher doesn't have to lie at your funeral. <laughs> Amen. 
Speak blessing over people because our words have the power of life and death and we need to choose to speak blessing over people, prosperity over people. That's what God wants us to do. Thirdly today, thirdly, not only does redemption uh, bring, bring renewed life and new life, re, uh, redemption brings blessing over people's lives, but redemption lastly can change a generation. Blessing and redemption can change a generation. You see, this story could have ended. Ruth could have decided uh, not to go with Naomi. Naomi could have decided she was just going to live out her life miserably, thinking God had abandoned her and done all of this. And Ruth chapter 1 would have just ended. Well, there probably wouldn't have been a book of Ruth. But because she made the decision to say, I'm going back to God. I'm going back to the place of God's provision. I'm going back with God's people. She made one right decision. And that, chain, that caused a chain reaction in her life. And God began to pour out blessings in her life. Did she doubt things along the way? Sure she did. Did she take matters into her own hands? You've read the story. Yeah, she took a few things in her own hands, but God was still working because she made that conscious decision to say, you know what, I am just going to surrender everything to God. And what it did was it changed not only her life and Ruth's life, but it changed generations upon generations. Because you made that decision to follow Jesus Christ. Because you made that decision to say, I'm going to raise my family in the house of God. They may not be here today. They may, in fact, be struggling today. But you made the right decision. You've got to trust in the providential working of God now, that God's in control. Because you made that decision, God is going to change generations. Verse 22 again says that Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. What an incredible lineage that Ruth and Naomi became a part of because of that one faithful decision. God is still in the business of redeeming. In fact, the book of Ruth ends with pointing to the greatest kinsman redeemer of all, and that was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who has not only come to redeem our life from the pit of hell, but he has come to redeem every area of our life, every bad decision that we've made, every time we took matters in our own hands. God is here to redeem it to pour blessing on your life and to change generations because of it. I stand here today, I believe that God has in fact done that in my family lineage. That God changed the direction and chose to make a better future for the next generation and that to follow. Galatians 3.13 tells us that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, in him we have redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. And then it goes on to say, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he has what? Lavished on us. And God's not done lavishing his grace and his love and his mercy on you. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back at this time. And we're going to begin to close our service. At the beginning of this message, as we, we kicked off this series, I entitled the book of Ruth as a little book with a big message. It is a significant book, I believe, in the history of the Jews. In fact, it was very significant to the Jewish people. I shared with you in one of the first messages that during the Feast of Weeks, uh, which they referred to as the Shabbat, they would, they would remind themselves of God's goodness. They would read through the, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. But there are many accounts of uh, during, this, during this feast, during this festival time, that they would literally sing the book of Ruth. Why did they do that? Why did they single that out? Because it was a story of God's redeeming grace in every area of our life. In fact, to them, it was a beautiful story of God's love for us. It was the greatest love story of all kind because it pointed to the greatest redeemer, and that was Jesus Christ. And I believe that today, I can stand confidently. I, I read this quote uh, by Spurgeon, and, and he, he was talking, it's, it's, a, it, it's a quote that he, that he had once uh, wrote to, to pastors, to preachers of the gospel. And he said uh, in this quote that you need to be so convinced of the message that you are preaching that you are willing to take it to the grave, or maybe that will be the cause of it. 
Because you are so convinced that this is the truth, that this is what God wants to do. And today I'm telling you, I am so convinced. I know just looking around, some of you are going through some some tremendous difficulties. I am so convinced that when you come back to the place of God's provision, I'm not saying you backslid, not at all. But if you make that statement and say, God, I'm coming back to you. In fact, I know we sang it earlier, but worship team, I'd like for us to sing Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus again in just a moment. And we're going to make a proclamation that Jesus, we trust in you. And when we do that, I feel so confident. I'm, I'm willing to go to the grave about it. That God's promise is the best is yet to come. He's not done. You know, the book of your life, it's probably only about there. I know some of you are sitting here thinking, well, I'm a little bit older. I'm a little bit older. My mom is celebrating her birthday today. She's a little bit older now. But God is not closing the book on your life. He's not done. He's not done with your life. I feel so confident today that I believe God wants to just really encourage you. It's the providential working of God that we must trust in. And that today, if you'd respond to him, just a moment, as as the worship team leads us in this beautiful song, I want to invite you. If everybody comes to the altar, I'll, I'll be as happy as could be, but you may not want to come to the altar, but I want you to respond to God today. To say, Jesus, I trust in you. I trust in you with my situations. Would you stand with us? Worship team, I'm just going to ask you. I'm not going to close this in prayer. I just really feel as the worship team leads us, I'm going to ask you to respond, whether it be in your seat. and There's just something powerful about coming around the altar, laying our lives down around the altar to say, Lord, I respond to you. I'm going to trust in you, whatever it is. Maybe you need to come with your spouse or family member and you need to just trust in God together. We'll gather around you. We're going to pray. But I'm believing that the best is yet to come, that God's not done. He hasn't closed the book on your life yet. He's still working. As we sing it, I'm going to implore you to just come around the altars and make this a declaration to God. Let's do it.